I just put down a few highlights. Um, Chuck has lived such a life, has done so many things, more things than most of us could ever imagine, that if we went into very much detail, you'd spend the whole night listening to me, and that's not what you're here for. So uh, let's do this quickly. <laughs> I wanted to stop that before it got out of hand, right? <laughs> you can't imagine the feeling I have being back in this venue tonight. It, it means so much, right? I walk these halls and they're full of memories that go back 40, 50 years. I've got friends that showed up that I haven't seen for decades. And it's just, uh, words fail. Words fail. And I don't want to get modern on you, but I just, um, and my voice is cracking because I'm recovering from some uh, foolishness from the last three months. It's coming back, good news, but I'm sure it'll record a little strange. But anyway, I uh, have to tell you, it's a, it's a real privilege being here tonight. And uh, I use this opening slide because what we're going to be trying to deal with tonight is not a lot of technical details as much as a pursuit of truth. Pilate so cynically asked, what is truth? And we find ourselves um, in a culture which denies the existence of truth. That used to be the quest of Western civilization, to seek truth. And we live in a culture which denies its existence, which is insanity, insanity. But um, how do we know what's really true? That's going to be a challenge tonight, because we're going to talk about some things that we've all been taught, not only in high school, but in college, that isn't true. We're going to explore some of that. And what we're really going to try to touch on here are the boundaries of our reality. That sounds a little highfalutin, but it's actually a very real practical issue that we all face. The more we know about what modern science really knows about our reality, the more comfortable Genesis chapter 1 reads. That may surprise you. But we're going to try to comfortably, without getting too technical, challenge the myths of our so-called science today. So before we go any further, I realize most of you that came tonight are old friends from uh, many, many years. But just in case there are new people that you brought that don't know me, let me just start a little bit by establishing our foundational discoveries that changed our life. I'm a technical guy from way back, as you probably can infer. Um, but there are two strategic discoveries that dominate my life since I was a teenager. The first discovery is that you, in your lap you have 66 books we call the Bible. Those 66 books are actually an integrated message system. What do I mean by that? 66 books penned by over 40 guys in a period of almost 2,000 years, and they didn't even know each other. What they have produced, we discover by examining it, is an integrated message. And I don't mean thematically that it, there's a theme in the old, fulfill in the new, and all that sort of stuff. No, no, no. What you need to discover for yourself is what I discovered early in my life, is that every number, every place name, every detail is there by deliberate design. And once you discover that, that's a staggering implication that this package of 66 books is designed in detail by a single author. And that's, that's the first discovery. The second discovery is that the origin of that design had to come from outside our time domain because it writes history in advance. And so epistemology, we'll use that term tonight, and that's a misunderstood term. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. Don't waste your time taking that in college because in college it's administered by the, by the uh, philosophy, typically the philosophy department, and it's simply a study of the different meanings of words through history. It doesn't talk about resources or tools. Epistemology 
is the study of knowledge. Now, our epistemological approach here is a very simple one, but an important one. If you carry away nothing away from tonight but this following chart, it'll be worth your trip being here. The first thing you need to do personally is to establish the integrity of the design of that book that's in your lap. Discover its integrity, that it was designed as a package for outside time. You say you can't prove the Bible. Yes, I'm so tired of people saying that on television. They want to say something nice. Sean Kennedy, you can't prove the Bible, but, and then they try to say something nice. I'm tired of hearing, you can prove the Bible. How? By discovering the integrity of that design, step one. Step two, you'll discover that design from cover to cover on every page points to a person. The Jews call the Messiah. And you then, once you do that, you establish the identity of who Christ is. And you can do that from that book. Once you realize who he is, he authenticates the package for you. That closes the loop. That's your epistemological cycle. And it's bulletproof if you take those steps. And you can put yourself on a sound epistemological footing. Well, so much for the introduction. That's where I come from, and that's what dominates my orientation. But we're going to explore tonight a little bit about the myths of science. We're going to challenge specifically the myths of astronomy. Now, many of you know that one of my many hobbies, even as a kid, was astronomy. How many of you have had astronomy in your background as a hobby or whatever? You? Many, many. Okay, over half of you, sure. Um, there was a time when I had money, a long time ago, I had a 14-inch Celestron. I mean, I was serious about it. If you go up to Big Bear, you'll see that domed house that has the, it was like an, that's, that, we, we took astronomy seriously. And I have to tell you, I'm startled to discover that most of what I've been taught in college, let alone in uh, high school, isn't true. And that's what we want to look at. You realize we've had myths of the past. You know, way back they talk about the flat earth, right? There was no excuse for that because Isaiah straightened that out long ago. But there's also, you may, if you study the history of science, there's a phlogiston's theory about what, oxygen, what burning really meant. And that's a bunch of foolishness you go through the history books. And uh, the, the, what we now know today is chemical oxidation. Then we had to Ptolemy. We had the Ptolemaic cosmology, who believed that, which was a geocentric universe. Everything revolved around the sun. That was the Ptolemaic. Ptolemy, by the way, is an interesting character. That was a, he was eclipsed, of course, by Copernicus with his, with his uh, sun-centered cosmology. Ptolemy is going to go down through history as having opposed the two great truths of science. The, the fact that we have a sun-centered solar system is one of the things he failed to perceive. And the other thing was he proved in his own mind there no, couldn't possibly be a fourth dimension. And that's, that's a matter of record. It's kind of interesting. And uh, he proved that the fourth dimension was impossible because he just couldn't visualize the, a four-dimensional ortho, orthogonal situation. And so uh, higher dimensional geometry now is the ultimate source of unity in, uh, in our present conceptions of the universe. So Ptolemy is going to have a very unusual place in history. But uh, then there's this whole business of ether that, you know, that they were trying to measure and so forth and um, as a medium for light. And the Michelson-Morley experiment punctured that whole idea. And I'm, that's dear to me, too, because they were, you know where Michelson-Morley did that experiment? At the Naval Academy, of all places. So we're, we're at, that's dear to us that we're Annapolis graduates. The velocity of light. You've had speakers here that it is part of the fellowship of the creative science thing, Barry Setterfield and so forth, that uh, uh, I pointed out way back, Romer and uh, uh, Olaf Romer, under the days of Descartes, he had such prestige in the scientific community, and everybody believed, as he did, that the speed of light was infinite. And it was instantaneous. But it was Olaf Romer, an astronomer, by measuring the eclipses of uh, the moons of Saturn, measured the speed of light and, uh, at 300,000 meters per second. But the whole scientific community failed to accept that for 50 years. They, were ignored, they just ignored his results until an Englishman by the name of Bradley did the same thing, repeated that experiment, and demonstrated the speed of light had a measurable finite speed. And so uh, uh, that, that was a big revelation back then. Barry Satterfield, a member of the fellowship here, um, and Trevor Norman, 